No, they can't use the road anymore. No. What? No, not by sea either. They, sh sh check it out, okay? They fly them in over the Himalayas. For real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Starting, starting now, starting now. Over the Himalayas. That's pretty impressive. All right. Bye. July 17th, 1942. Your armies are off and running. Your tanks are crashing through the enemy. But you second guess yourself, thinking that if they were over here or over there, they'd crush the enemy. So you issue new orders and those orders are followed and you create one big traffic jam. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, an Allied shipping convoy in northern waters met with disaster, putting an end to such convoys until there is less daylight in the north. There was more fighting in North Africa, though inconclusive, and on the eastern front, Falblau, the big Axis summer offensive, continued, taking Voronezh and loads of territory, though there is big friction between Adolf Hitler and Fedor von Bock over the conduct of the offensive. The first phase of Falblau is complete. And logically, it is time for Blau Phase 2. The plan was for Ewald von Kleist's 1st Panzer Army to make a thrust south of Kharkov, head along the north bank of the Donets, break through the Red Army, and link up with Hermann Hoth's 4th Panzers and Friedrich Palace's 6th Army somewhere around Visochanovka. This would surround another huge cauldron of the enemy that would be broken up by 6th Army and the Italian 8th Army. But as we saw last week, the situation has changed pretty drastically, even though Blau 2 was launched already on the 9th. And how did it go? Well, as Robert Cetino writes, what happened over the course of the next few days, in any other context but war, could only be described as a comedy. The orders to link up near Visochanovka are pretty much obsolete from day one. The 6th Army spearhead, the 40th Panzer Corps, is going so fast they'll be south of Visochanovka before Kleist can get there. So he gets new orders to head east for Milerovo and then link up further south. But the 4th Panzer Army is having major fuel problems, having just covered 400 kilometers in 12 days. And it even has a couple divisions stopped because they're out of gas. So on the 11th, the 1st Panzers get their third operational orders in three days, heading generally for Kamensk, a river crossing. This is new orders to go into a different direction with his whole tank army each day. For Kleist, the opening of Blue 2 was a nightmare of shifting objectives, constantly chattering teletypes bearing new orders, and a sense that he was not really the commander of the 1st Panzer Army. It was pretty clear to all the men in the field by now, Bock, List, and their army commanders alike, that the only result from a maneuver on Milerovo would be a traffic jam of immense proportions. As you may imagine, had there been any large enemy forces in the region standing to fight them, this would have kept the German armies a distance from each other. But there aren't. So on the 15th, the vanguards of all three armies meet around Milerovo. Not to say that there are no Soviet forces at all in the region, because there are. There are loads of them, columns heading east or southeast at top speed. But the result is a bunch of enemy armies crossing each other's marching lines perpendicular to each other. The German vanguards are panzers all alone without infantry support, so they can't stop the columns. They can hassle them, they can attack them, but at Milerovo, they only managed to take some 40,000 prisoners total. I say only because, yeah, it's a huge number, but a fraction of what they've planned to take. Because remember, the whole idea of Falblau is not just about taking land. It is destroying the enemy's armies and his ability to fight. That's what the directive says. General Karl Wagner, 40th Panzer Corps Chief of Staff writes, while the heads of the divisions smashed unhindered through numerous retreating enemy columns, all the movements of the Corps suffered under ever stronger enemy attacks against its flanks and rear, where the Russians were seeking to break through from the west to the east. The main arteries were broken over and over again, and supply was only possible through armed convoys. This was the reason the fighting troops began to experience fuel shortages. Telephone communications were cut constantly. Looking at it overall, operationally, Fall Blau, 
with all of the staggered starts and objectives and would-be encirclements was a failure. More than that, it's a mess. Huge armored forces are stuck in a gigantic traffic jam around Milarovo, some with no fuel, and the infantry is plodding along on the flanks. And that is exactly the opposite of how the Wehrmacht fought and succeeded in the USSR in 1941. Quick mobile units turned the enemy flank and rear, and the infantry made the frontal assault. Well, if you know the German army, you know they're going to need a scapegoat. And the first one to go is Army Group B Commander Fedor von Bock, who resigns today on the 17th. This is his second dismissal. We saw the first last December. The reason given for him having to go is for tying up the armor too long around Voronezh. He is replaced as Army Group B Commander by Maximilian von Weichs, who also had been determined to attack and hold Voronezh. On the 11th, Hitler orders Operation Blucher, an attack across the Kerch Straits into the Caucasus by Erich von Manstein's 11th Army. On the 13th, Manstein gets orders to be ready by the end of the month. This is to assist the hopeful future drive down the Caucasus by Army Group A. See, the next phase of Blau was to be a drive towards Stalingrad and the Volga to act as a screen for that drive down the Caucasus behind them, which was to happen after the destruction of the Red Army west of the Great Bend in the River Don. But that destruction did not happen. On the 13th, Hitler alters his plans and designates Stalingrad a major objective for Army Group B, and not just a covering role for A. This is typical of Hitler's inability to observe the military law of maintenance of the objective. But that doesn't mean Blau is over. And for the Soviets, Semyon Timoshenko's southwestern front is in a dire state. With Timoshenko's headquarters at Kalash, the Stavka decided to try binding the center and left of southwestern front and the southern front. But as Malinovsky's southern front was struck by Ruoff's 17th Army and Kleist's 1st Panzers, this proved to be quite unworkable. On the 12th of July, with the southwestern front practically ripped to pieces, its rear and that of the southern front threatened by the German southeasterly drive, Stavka Directive Number 170495 formally set up the Stalingrad front with Marshal Timoshenko in command, Nikita Khrushchev as Commissar, and P.I. Boldin as Chief of Staff. But the Stalingrad front is assigned the 62nd, 63rd, and 64th Armies who are now on trains or forced marching to a front whose location its commanders barely know. Last week, Stavka's July 6 directive allowed all four southwestern front armies to withdraw, but they had specific points to withdraw to and hold, and this they have failed to do. A gap was created between the 28th and 38th armies, and by the 8th, German panzer spearheads from the 40th Panzer Corps were operating in their rear, and that was before Kleist's first panzer army even kicked off Blau II, the 9th. As this week gets going, elements of the scattered 38th head east, pursued by units of the German 6th Army. Most of Timoshenko's airfields have fallen, so he has 8th Air Army shift to bases further east, which takes away all aerial support for the 28th and 38th, and then comes the formation of the Stalingrad Front. With the defenses of Timoshenko's southwestern front collapsing and Malinovsky's southern front incapable of providing any meaningful assistance, the Stavka suddenly recognized the gravity of the situation and drastically reorganized its forces, virtually writing off the 28th and 38th armies. By the end of this week, what are basically skeletons of the 28th, 38th, and 57th armies reached the forward positions of the Stalingrad front on the Don River. They are put under Timoshenko's control, but they weren't supposed to be. They were supposed to join the Southern Front, but it totally lost touch and headed east instead. As for the Southern Front, on the 16th with Stavka approval, Malinovsky orders all four armies to withdraw to the Don south of Rostov, moving 20 kilometers per night over five nights. But there are other Soviet units about to make new attacks. Today on the 17th, Stavka orders the Bryansk Front to attack southward from west of Voronezh and the Voronezh Front to attack westward through the city to circle and destroy the enemy forces in the regions. Attacks are scheduled from the 18th to the 21st. I've talked before about the terrain the Blau operation must try to cross. And I'd like to talk about some 
other terrain right now. Specifically, that at El Alamein in North Africa, where the Axis and Allies now face each other. We've seen fighting across a large chunk of North Africa, and it is here that the British are trying to prevent Elvin Rommel from breaking into Egypt and Suez. Here, among the featureless expanse of oceans of sand. Fred Magdaleni writes this about the terrain in the Battle of El Alamein, though. It was no accident that this was the place where the campaign came to rest. At first sight, this stretch of desert was no different from any other. It was apparently the same expanse of flatness varied only by the same occasional ridges and mounds, one or two corresponding depressions. But this stretch of desert was different. From a military point of view, it was unique. It was the only area of the desert battleground where there were two secure flanks, which is a pretty big difference. I mean, everywhere there has the Mediterranean Sea to the north, of course, but just here, some 60 kilometers south of the coast, lies the Katara Depression, an area of salt marshes and sand dunes the size of Lake Ontario that lies below sea level. Here, wheeled vehicles cannot go. And even if they could, it's protected to the north by cliffs 200 meters high. The mobile tactics of desert warfare had evolved from there being normally only one secure flank, the sea. The offensives launched by both sides had hitherto been based on the whirlwind outflanking attack around the open south flank of the adversary, which the desert offered everywhere else but here. This was the only ground where those tactics could not be applied. Well, over the past 10 days, the fighting there has been inconclusive. But at the end of last week, Rommel has finally been thrown over to the defensive. Both sides make costly attacks this week in the north at Tel El Asa. The main result is a bunch of bodies on both sides. Though the Australians capture or destroy most of the 621 Radio Intercept Company, who it turns out had the British call sign book on them. In the center this week, the Italian divisions are attacked hard at Ruesat Ridge. See, Allied theater commander Claude Auchinleck is aware the Germans cannot hold extended fronts without Italian help. The 2nd New Zealand Division and 5th Indian and 2nd Armored Brigades put a lot of pressure on them the 14th through the 16th. The result of all this fighting and an attack on Mitterra Ridge is the serious attrition of the Italian forces. Three of their divisions are badly weakened, and by the end of this week, Rommel has only around half the tanks of the British, who have 173 operational, but also a bunch more on their way or in reserve. Auchinleck's plan is more attacks at Tel El Asa and Ruesat Ridge next week. In fact, this week, Rommel's supply issues are now so bad, he suggests a retreat to Chief of Commando Supremo Hugo Cavallero and local Luftwaffe Chief Smiling Albert Kesselring. Kesselring gets some bad regional news himself this week, which is great news for the Allies, I guess. Over the previous six weeks, 692 German and Italian planes were shot down by Maltese defenses and another 190 by British planes based on Malta. And here are a few notes to end this week, starting with another aviation one. On the 15th, the first supplies flown over the hump reached Chiang Kai-shek. He can only be supplied now by air over the eastern end of the Himalayas since the Japanese took control of the Burma Road. On the 16th, Adolf Hitler transfers his headquarters from Rastenburg to Vinitsa, and the Veldiv Roundup takes place the 16th and 17th. This is a mass arrest of Jewish families in Paris. It is a joint operation by the German and Vichy French administrations and involves the French police. According to the Paris Police Prefecture, 13,152 people are arrested, over 4,000 of them children. They are to be sent to Auschwitz. This is covered in depth in our War Against Humanity subseries, so you should check that out. Which you can do fairly soon, because this week of the war is at its end. A week of stalemate in North Africa that leads to attrition one side can little afford. And the beginning of the second phase of Fall Blau, which hits the Soviets hard, but doesn't take nearly the prisoners expected and leads to a traffic jam. That was caused by Hitler issuing new orders 
without really knowing the realities of logistics. And though his subordinates might complain, this is the new top-down command structure of the German army, which is very different from anything the various commanders have experienced before. But as we know, the German armies operate on a razor-thin logistical margin, and driving hundreds of tanks one direction one day and another the next day is certainly not going to help that. Neither is the Red Army withdrawing instead of allowing itself to be taken in giant encirclement attempts. Giant encirclement attempts that use tons of fuel. Hitler better be careful. Another huge traffic jam in the near future might have a much worse outcome. And the last thing the Wehrmacht can afford this summer is to run out of gas. Automobiles do need that on which to run in 1942 at least. And hey, if you want to go back a little further and see Henry Ford, whose name is synonymous with the automobile and his connections with fascism, then click right here for our Between Two Wars Season 2 Zeitgeist episode on just that. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Peter Kuiman. The army is the gasoline on which our productions run. What do you think, Sparty? That was good. That was good. Yeah, see? So help fill our tank at timeghost.tv or patreon.com, and you will get cool perks too. Do not forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.